Hi, this is the official podcast of the WCD. That's the World Congress of Dermatology, which will be held next in Singapore in 2023. I'm Dr. Etienne Wang from the National Skin Centre of Singapore, and I will be your host for this podcast. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can register for the WCD at the website wcd2023singapore.org, and we are currently accepting late-breaking abstracts until 10th of March. Today, my co-host Sashin is back for a dumb topic for discussion in this third season. Welcome back, Sashin. Hi, Ian. Thanks, thanks, and it's great to be back. It's 2023, and it's now coming to like monthly countdown to the WCD, so that's very exciting. Yes, yes, and congratulations on your um, you passed your exams, right? Thank you very much. Yes, I did. So now you're associate consultant. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and what are we discussing today? Yeah, so I thought we'd talk about something that's very relevant to what we're doing actually, which is podcasting. Specifically oh, yes. to talk about um, podcasting and its role in dermatology education. Hmm. Do you have any um, favorite podcasts you listened to while you were a resident, which you found useful? Yes. So especially towards the, the second half of my residency, uh, one thing that I really got into was uh, dermatology podcasts. And part of this was because I myself was involved in this podcast. But, you know, just searching for other podcasts, I came across a couple of uh, different ones. And I think in terms of categories, there were some three main categories. One of them was uh, resident education. The other was uh, research and, you know, current topics in dermatology and innovation. And the third was patient support groups. Now, what really um, interested me was the first, which was resident education. You can imagine that being in the final year of a residency, uh, sometimes you just want to fit in a little studying here and there. Um, so I, I did come across some very um, engaging, fun, interesting podcasts out there. Probably my favorite was one that's called The Gren Zone. And uh, these podcasts are on Spotify. So The Gren Zone has uh, bite-sized information uh, delivered in a very, very entertaining, um, engaging manner. So there were mnemonics. They even did voices. So there was, um, they would even act out a dermatology uh, consultant on the, on the wards. When you recommended this this um, podcast, I did uh, go and have a listen to a few episodes. And there's a Dr. Grumpy Pants who comes in and is quite sarcastic and quite mean to the listener. Yes. Which I think is quite funny. It's almost like a puppet on Sesame Street exactly, talking to you. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> yeah. it, it changes things up. There were interesting mnemonics. They acted out anxious patients. Uh, there was music in there. They did accents. So I thought that was very entertaining, especially on, say, um, a 20-minute MRT ride home. It was a fun way to get some information in there. Yes, I think so too. I think before we get into the list of other podcasts, I think why don't we discuss the rise in podcasts and how this is actually impacting um, how people consume media and education as well. I myself, personally, I'm quite an audio learner. So, I mean, all this time I've always learned best by discussing and hearing people talk through things. Are you the same? Definitely. So uh, I, I guess I'm a combination of visual and audio because I do love uh, sounds, music, accents and doing impressions. So I think for me, having something read out to me, even if it's something I've read on paper before, does make a big difference. Yeah. When I was a medical student, I used to tape record myself reading my notes and play it under my pillow. Wow. <laughs> no, well, that's so, another level. So- you know, because I really do find that I get I, I learn when I listen to someone talk about the subject rather than uh, looking at it or writing on it. But everyone's slightly different. So um, what other podcasts have you found interesting? So another one I found interesting was the uh, EADV podcast. And that's been going on for some time now. Um, these are also bite-sized. Most of the, um, the episodes were less than half an hour. So again, very convenient for uh, listening on your commute to or from work. Uh, another one I found interesting was called the Dermosphere. Uh, there was the uh, St. John's, so from the UK, the St. John's Institute also has uh, podcasts where they select topics. They're, they're restricted to a short time, but the topics may span two or three episodes, and they usually bring a content expert. For example, uh, I found sarcoidosis to be a challenging topic. It, it's the great imitator, one of the great imitators. Uh, so as a resident, I listened to their sarcoid uh, podcast, which I found very interesting, they have a sarcoid clinic there, and um, it spanned all the way from diagnosis to treatment. So little pearls on the uh, St. John's uh, podcast. Mm, okay, so um, for myself, some of the dermatology podcasts that I listen to are Dermatology Times, which is a like 10-minute bite-sized podcast where they interview uh, experts in the field. And then the one that I really like is a cutaneous connection, which um, also is quite short and very informative on uh, very recent topics in dermatology. 
the next category of podcast that you brought up was um, for science communication. Was that right? Yes. And I found that this was usually from, like I mentioned, like EADV. I mean, it's uh-huh. something that we are doing as well for WCD, where we try to include um, uh, the science component to it as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. For myself, um, the, the ones that I really like, uh, the Nature Podcast, uh, New Scientist, and also there's this um, very research-intensive podcast called the Stem Cell Podcast, where they talk about very recent stem cell research. And that's a very, very informative way of learning about recent advances in the field. For myself, there are these other couple of other science communication podcasts that I really like. One is called Ologies. Have you heard of that one? I haven't actually. I'll look it it's up. It's called Ologies and it's hosted by this really, really funny comedian called Ali Ward where she speaks to an ologist a, a week and it spans everything from sociology to archaeology to biology and everything. And I really started listening to her because there was a, a trichologist, <laughs> one wow. of my friend, one of my hair researcher friends was on this podcast at one point and I really, really like this podcast. And the other one is, called, of course, Freakonomics MD where um, uh, Dr. Babu Jenner talks about the, the economics of medicine in America. So I think that's very interesting as well. Awesome. You mentioned yeah. some patient support podcasts. What what patient support podcasts have you found that are useful? Yeah, so I actually came across these when I was looking for little nuggets of information on Spotify because you know how YouTube has a lot of educational material for dermatology. So I looked up whether there were any topics like this covered on uh, Spotify. And to my surprise, more, more so than uh, actual lectures, what I did come across were patient support group, so by patients with a certain skin condition for other patients. This ranged all the way from eczema to psoriasis to sarcoidosis uh, to even dermatomyositis, more commonly for chronic conditions. But I found the easiest way was just to search a particular skin condition on Spotify. And there were um, accounts of uh, episodes for a, a particular condition, for example, a patient with psoriasis would have several episodes on, for example, treatment options that they were offered, how it's affected their lives, how other patients have inspired them, and um, also, you know, from a psychological perspective, inspiring other patients and supporting them through their journey. Mm-hmm. The two patient support podcasts that I listen to are the Alopecia Project and the Bald Truth, because mainly that's my my field of interest. Um, I think that we have to put a bit a bit of a caveat here that some of these patient led podcasts might have some uh, misinformation, which I think is very important for us to know about. So I think even if there's some inaccuracies, I think it's important for dermatologists to know what the patients are actually receiving from the internet and from other sources as well. So it's a good way to also combat misinformation. So I think it's it's important that we. We also dip into these podcasts now and then, especially the Bald Truth, which is a podcast for androgenic alopecia. They go into a lot of the science, but there are quite a lot of very interesting perspectives <laughs> on that on that podcast, which some of which I do not agree with. Right, it is a double edged sword when it comes to um, how information is delivered through you know something that's not regulated. So there is, it does become very accessible. But like you mentioned, yes, we sometimes have to question and make sure that we are getting the right information from these sources. Excellent. Are there any other podcasts that you find very interesting? Um, actually, I mean, in terms of dermatology, I think these would be the main ones that I've been, I've been looking at. Um, there are also some podcasts where uh, they actually go through papers. So select two papers, for example, uh, with references and then go through uh, almost like a journal critique. Mm. I think um, for, for myself, I, I wrote down a few of the other podcasts that I really like that our listeners might enjoy. Um, there's a very good podcast on statistics called More or Less by the BBC, and they talk about statistics and how it's applied to everyday life. So I think that's something that, you know, not all of us are very good at, and it's very interesting to learn how it really impacts us in everyday life. Um, I, I'm also listening to a lot of cosmetic science podcasts, one called The Beauty Brains, which talks about cosmetic science, because this is something that we don't learn in residency and we don't learn in school. So, you know, um, as dermatologists, I think we need to know what's out there and what patients bring to us. So I think cosmetic science is something that we, there's a bit of a blind spot for us. And also the science of beauty by, by Allure. Um, if you're talking about Singapore, Singapore has a bit of a health podcast called Heart to Health Talk. And it's by um, students at um, NUS. And I was actually a guest on this podcast. So if any of our listeners are interested, they can go and look for Heart to Health Talk. Of course, all these will be listed, um, they'll be linked in our description. Oh, and just another thing that I'd like to add was, and another interesting podcast was called Topical, the Dermatology Podcast. And this was um, more about the journey to becoming a dermatologist. So for those of, uh, you know, other doctors out there who are perhaps junior doctors on the road through residency, that's something inspiring. So it talks about uh, all the way from a medical student through um, residency, some of the experiences at those stages. 
Okay, well, there's a lot of recommendations for our listeners. I think they have a lot of things to listen to over the next few months. <laughs> Absolutely, while counting down to the WCD. Yes. Okay, so thank you, Sashin. That was very interesting. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Uh, okay, bye. Bye. And now I'd like to invite Professor Stephen Thung to the podcast. Stephen is a senior advisor for the Pigment Clinic in the National Skin Centre and the chief dermatologist at the Skin Research Institute of Singapore. He was executive director of the Skin Research Institute of Singapore from January 2017 to February 2020. And his current research interests are on pigmentary disorders, novel drugs delivery systems, and advanced imaging of skin cancer. Welcome, Stephen, to the podcast. Hi, Etienne. It's nice to be here. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Stephen, you are one of the people that I really looked up to in my career because you are both a clinician and also you do quite a lot of research as well. Can you tell us a bit more about your current research interests? Currently, I'm working in three main areas, as you mentioned. Pigmentary disorders. I'm looking at uh, new pathways uh, for melasma. Over the last seven years or so, I've been working on the polymine pathway and finally, we've discovered the, um, an interesting pathway leading to melasma. We've even taken the signs of it into the clinics. We've developed uh, polyamine inhibitors. And we've just finished our first in-human clinical trial on the polyamine inhibitor for melasma with uh, very interesting results. Wow, that's very encouraging because melasma, as we all know, is very difficult to treat. And a lot of the patients I see, their melasma tends to recur no matter what we do. Um, Is there any new pathways in this polyamine pathway that might address this? So in one of our earlier studies, when we wanted to understand and discover new pathways. We did uh, a lesional and non-lesional biopsy of melasma patients. And then we found that uh, in the melanocytes of the melasma patients, they actually have upregulated uh, polyamines, uh, mainly uh, putrescine. And there was nothing about polyamines and pigmentary disorders. And we did a whole series of, uh, of clinical experiments from uh, in vitro monolayer cells uh, to animal studies to understand and discover how does polyamine affect uh, pigmentation. And in our uh, studies, we also discover that the melasma patients, the lesional skin of melasma patients express more putrescine compared to non-lesional skins and compared to control. And that's where it leads us into uh, polyamine inhibitors for the treatment of melasma. And by next year, we should be re- wrapping up a study comparing our polymer inhibitors to the state-of-the-art or to current gold standard to Triluma. So we are doing a, a left-right uh, control trial now comparing polymer inhibitors to, with Triluma. And we are quite sure or we are hoping that the polymer inhibitors will work much better than Triluma in the management of melasma. Wow, okay, that's very, very hopeful. Um, the other area of your research interest is skin imaging. Can you tell us a bit more about that and what excites you in this field currently? I started my imaging research uh, uh, way back in 2012, almost 10 years ago. At that point in time, I was interested in looking for ways to study the skin without taking a biopsy. So I had the privilege to travel to Moderna to work uh, with uh, Pelicani Giovanni on the use of confocal. Since then, uh, we have explored the use of confocal in, in National Skin Center. We've deployed it uh, now for clinical service for the di- diagnosing of skin cancer without biopsy. Moving away from diagnosis of skin cancer, the next thing I wanted to solve was how do I map out skin cancers in three dimensions so that we can instruct the surgeons how deep, how wide to excise the skin tumors. That's when we started the mapping of skin cancers using photoacoustic systems. I think we are probably one of the first in the world to be able to map basal cell carcinoma in three dimensions to tell exactly how deep, how wide the basal cell carcinoma is. And now we are going into a prospective trial whereby we map out all these basal cell carcinomas and we are providing it to our term surgeons for them to excise accordingly and we wanted to see how accurate our skin cancer mapping using photoacoustic systems is and in future if we are successful then we would uh, probably be able to provide this service for patients with skin cancer for those centers with more surgery we will probably be able to limit or reduce the stages of moles needed to excise uh, basal cell carcinoma for the centers without 
more surgery. This will tell the surgeons exactly how big the tumor is and how how deep to cut uh, the basal cell carcinoma. That sounds very useful. And I think I've seen some of your preliminary data, which is very impressive. And I imagine this will be of much interest to be presented at the World Congress later this year. Uh, certainly, I mean, I've, 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 uh, I've presented my data at the last World Congress in Milan about the mapping of skin cancers, uh, especially uh, basal cell carcinomas. We are uh, hitting about 95% accuracy at this point in time. Wow, that's that's very impressive. There's a very interesting thing in your career history, um, Stephen, that for 10 years you were actually in the Singapore Armed Forces as a, doing humanitarian medicine. Is uh, that, Can you tell us a bit more about that? That's, that's a very unusual career yeah, that was my previous life. <laughs> I started yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, my career not as a dermatologist, but as a disaster trained doctor. Uh, upon graduation, my interest was have always been uh, in uh, disaster medicine. So I spent about 12 years of my career um, going to different countries, whether it's civil unrest or disaster zone, uh, to provide uh, medical support for those countries and to set up medical teams so that we can deliver uh, immediate medical care uh, in disaster zones. So that was uh, my previous life. I only joined dermatology uh, in 2008 at the grand old age of almost 38 years old. Wow. (laughs) Was there anything that you learned in those 10 years which you actually applied to dermatology or even running the Skin Research Institute of Singapore, which you did an amazing job during your tenure there, transforming it from a virtual institute to something, a very dynamic research institute with um, very distinct research cornerstones and groups? Okay, the greatest takeaway for me, other than uh, being able to work in disaster zones and to understand uh, disaster medicine, uh, was actually working in disaster medicine draw me into biomedical engineering research. I know at the very early stage of uh, my career in the, in disaster medicine, one of the things that I was set out to do or that uh, I, I set myself out to do was to be able to deploy an operating theater anywhere in Asia Pacific area with uh, just helicopters and, and we can just fly a, a modular operating theater into a disaster zone and to start functioning from there. To enable me to do that, uh, I had got to uh, explore uh, working with biomedical engineers to shrink all the equipments and the OT that we need to bring into theater. And that uh, really uh, led me to NTU, Nanyang Technological University. Got to meet uh, then uh, the provost of NTU, Professor Freddie Boy. And we since then started this relationship of uh, bringing biomedical engineering research into medical care. So after um, my stint in disaster medicine upon coming back to the National Skin Centre, I continued this uh, research in biomedical engineering. And that's why uh, I'm able to uh, bring together the three different parties, the biomedical engineers from NTU, ASTAR, the Bio- Biological Sciences and National Skin Center to set up the Skin Research Institute of Singapore. And it all started from my relationship with uh, biomedical engineers in 2008. Mm, well, yeah, sounds like you were the perfect person <laughs> for the job. And um, Stephen, won't you let us know what you are looking forward to most for the WCD in July? For WCD in, in July, I think there are two things that uh, I'm looking forward to. One is really to uh, host all the dermatologists that's coming over to Singapore and uh, to, to show them the, the beautiful country that we have, the exciting uh, dermatology research scene that we, we currently have in Singapore. And of course, at the same time, to meet up with all my friends that I've built up relationship we research with uh, over the last uh, 20 years. So um, I'm, I'm going to be very excited to meet up with people. The other area that we're excited in, in is really to discover and learn any new sciences that's going to be presented uh, during the World Congress. And hopefully uh, we can work together, uh, together with uh, other researchers to advance skin research for the care of our patients. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. And I think um, it's, it's the first time the WCD is in this region of the world. I think we're going to have quite an interesting social program highlighting Southeast Asian dermatology.
Certainly, I mean, I'm looking forward yeah, to yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to that too, especially um, on how research in dermatology in this area in Southeast Asia can really impact and and, and improve care for uh, global dermatology. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much for your time today, and uh, we're looking forward to the WCD in July. Certainly, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Etienne, for uh, spending this time <laughs> and for inviting me today. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the official podcast of the WCD. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram at WCD2023 Singapore and check out the WCD website WCD2023Singapore.org for more updates and content on the WCD. Discounted early bird registration has been extended to lower and lower middle income countries until June and if you missed the abstract deadline, there will be another chance for late-breaking abstracts in January 2023. And until next time, stay safe and use sunblock. Okay.